our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And, and also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let us pray. God of all power and might, you are the giver of all that is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need. And keep us safe in your care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. Well, what's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. about one's fashion sense. And yeah, true, there was that time in the late 90s and early aughts when the Matrix made it look like these bad boys might be hip and in style, but that was really short-lived. So no, it's not to make a, a fashion statement. To be perfectly clear, whether one prefers to wear skinny jeans or the uniform, it's a, an adiaphron. That is something that is neither directly commanded nor forbidden by God's word. It, God doesn't say a, 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 a thing on the matter. And yet, there's good reason 
that this particular get-up has been the uniform of the clergy since AD 400. See, it's intended to make a statement, just not a, a fashion one. And the statement that it makes very, very plainly is that the purpose of wearing this is to hide the man. And that's because there isn't a man on earth who is up to the job. There isn't a man on earth who has the gravitas or the capability for the job. And so the reason we wear this cloth contraption called an alb and its colorful counterpart called a stole is to hide the man, to make it crystal clear to everyone that it doesn't depend on the man's panache or persuasion but on the promise that is embedded in God's word that anything at all happens by what is spoken. It's a good uniform. Because there isn't a person, a man alive, who is up for the job. Unless, I suppose, he were somehow tied to Christ. So that when he spoke, he spoke with Jesus and on behalf of Jesus. And wouldn't you know it, but this changing colors with the season would represent the yoke that would bind that individual to Christ, as it were. And the robe would represent the robe of Christ's own righteousness, by which this man is qualified for no other reason than that Jesus had said so. So it's a pretty good uniform as it happens, and it's the reason it's been used by the clergy since 400 A.D. approximately. But yeah, it's not to make a fashion statement. I, I don't suppose it's going to be winning any runway awards in Paris anytime soon, though, given the state of fashion. Who knows? As far as statements are concerned, we have some pretty direct, pretty incredible statements from our Savior Jesus before us this day from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 6. And those statements that Jesus makes, we want to be very, very sure to make no mistake about it, that, that this carpenter is no tired old saw. Speaking of old saws, that, that is, wise sayings that have been used so long that they, they pass for common wisdom. There, there's an awful lot of those about home, aren't there? Home sweet home. Home is where the heart is. There's no place like home. And so one would think that when we hear, as we do through St. Mark's reporting, that Jesus is going to his hometown, well, isn't that nice? Good, good for him that he's getting to go home. And, and then Mark continues and we hear what was he going to do but that on the Sabbath day he's going to go to the synagogue and he's going to preach and teach as it were. And, well, well, how awesome. I mean, who, who better than Jesus, right, to preach God's word? Who better? to be the guest preacher in the synagogue for that day, then the, the hometown boy made good. It's all so, so nice, so excellent. And it doesn't even dawn on us that it's actually not all that nice at all. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed, and you're thinking, well, well of course, uh, Jesus, he's the one teaching. How do you get better than Jesus? Only it wasn't so much that they were amazed as it was they were shocked. Shocked as in appalled. In their questions, they don't even try to hide their contempt. Where'd this man, where'd this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? Where are these remarkable miracles he is performing. Contempt is just dripping off of their words. 
As if they didn't know. As if they didn't know who this man was. They had grown up with him, for crying out loud. Some of them in the very same home with the very same parents. Who is this man? As if they didn't know. As if they didn't know where he had gotten this wisdom and these remarkable powers from. Or, or do you think do you think that Mary never bothered to tell anyone about the night of his miraculous birth and the angels singing and the shepherds visiting? Or do you suppose that the question never came up, hey, where'd you guys go? when they had to sojourn down to Egypt for two years because Herod was intent on killing the boy who would be king of the Jews. You think they never answered the question? Oh, we were down in Egypt because Herod was trying to kill him. As if nobody would have noticed when as a 12-year-old boy, Jesus stayed behind, hang out, as it were, with the guys who were the preachers and teachers and talk a little shop. As if that would not have gotten around. Who is this man? It's so condescending. So absolutely pathetic. That they would treat him with such contempt. And why? Why were they treating him in the manner in which they were treating him? Well, is this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And there it is. The reason they were treating him with such contempt, such disdain, such loathing is because he was familiar, too familiar, as it were. And as old saws go, we know that familiarity breeds contempt. So they hated Jesus, even though they should have known better. Ever since the time of Moses, it had been prophesied that they should be on the lookout for one just like Moses. You know, a prophet from among your own brothers, who is going to speak all of the words which God gives him, so that you must listen to him, as if that weren't enough by itself having grown up in the exact same town and the exact same house as Jesus. How could they not have known better? It wasn't that they didn't know better. It's that it didn't matter. And they were offended at him. That is, this Jesus in all his pathetic familiarity was a stumbling block to the word of God which he was speaking. Where did the wisdom come from? Where did the power come from? It couldn't have been more obvious. It couldn't have been more reasonable. It had come from God because he had come from God. What applications might we make for ourselves on the basis of this account from Jesus' life. Does familiarity with God's word and with God's messengers still breed contempt? Well, you know all the tired old saws all too well. <laughs> You've heard it all before. Nothing really new that you can tell me. It's just God's word, after all. Yeah, I know I should go, but it just... The preacher doesn't do it for me. He rolls on and on, and his sermons are too long, and they're too hard to follow, and I can't be bothered to actually listen to the way I might listen to a Brewers game or a Bucks game. You know all the tired old saws. Oh, we're so busy. We got 
kids in this, and we got kids in that, and we've got the cabin up north, and we got all this. Does familiarity breed contempt? What applications might we make in our own lives from this account in Jesus' life? Make no mistake about it, friends. This, this carpenter, he is no tired old saw. He is God, come to earth to proclaim an urgent message to humanity. It is the only message of any consequence. It is the only message that will ever matter. It is the only word that is reliable and certain, that is bedrock and unchanging. Make no mistake about it, this carpenter is no old saw as though his words might just be dismissed or even worse, just hated outright loathed. Make no mistake about it, this carpenter is no tired old saw. He is God in the flesh, so that when he speaks, this, this carpenter as he appears, is God himself speaking. Would you really... Would you really care to ignore what he has to say? May it never be so. Because this is the only word that matters. The only word that is sure, the only word that is certain. Jesus met that rejection in his hometown in the most interesting way maybe imaginable. Did you catch it? Way at the end. Only two times in the New Testament do we hear that Jesus is amazed at something, as if as though God could be amazed. But here he is, amazed. The one time we hear that Jesus is amazed, it's in connection with the foreigner's faith, which is so strong that it would take nothing but scraps from the master's table. And the other time, here in his hometown, where faith is so weak, he can't possibly dare to do anything because nobody would even ask. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus would be caused this kind of amazement by faith, both on the part of his kinsmen and on the part of his foreigner. Why is it that Jesus is amazed by faith or its lack? Maybe it has something to do with the fact that he is, in a word, amazing. It's his name. After all, Isaiah foretold it, prophesied it when he said, he will be called wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It is because, in a word, he is Amazing, He is wonderful. And what makes him wonderful is the fact that given how we receive him and how we are tempted to reject him, how we are tempted to see him as just, and his word as some just tired old saw, that yeah, I know, in spite of it all, he doesn't change his word, or change his plan. Isn't that wonderful? His love would be so broad and so deep and so wide and so high that he would condescend to humanity, not just in taking on human flesh to be our substitute that we desperately need, but he would continue to endure the indignity and the disgrace of putting his word out there for people even though they don't want it. In a word, he is amazing. 
that he shouldn't change his word or his plan or his mind, except when it comes to our sins. As he removes them as far away from us as east is from west, so that they can never condemn us again. Isn't he amazing that he would, in his immortality, become mortal and take on and suffer death only, only to shake his finger at it and rise again, guaranteeing that all who hear his word and believe it might also likewise rise and live? What else would you call it than wonderful and amazing? And this carpenter, this Jesus, average and ordinary looking as he is because he has stepped into our humanity and into our place, would proclaim a word so unfathomable it leaves a person speechless. See, the spirit-lived life listen even when everyone else fails to listen. Because this carpenter, he is no tired old saw. Amen. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich treasure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick. Cheer those who are sad. Calm those who are distressed. And comfort all who are bold and in Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessings to every nation on earth, where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth, protect and comfort us from all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 